Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Peter and welcome to another video. This time we're going to talk about uh, a bit of an experience that, that I've had recently um, and I feel like it's a very interesting topic and uh, a bit of a cautionary tale at the same time. So I had an opportunity to work with uh, two of my friends on a game development project and we are using uh, Unity. It's a game engine where you can use C Sharp to basically uh, build your game. Uh, but the feature that I found very interesting was to basically import arbitrary DLLs, right? So you could actually have all of your game logic be written completely independently of the game engine, which I like because I have no interest in Unity classes and Unity weird implementations because, you know, of course, Unity has been here for a while and at the in the beginning they even used JavaScript. So how good can their classes really be? Uh, <laughs> this is, of course, a joke. Unity is pretty solid. Um, anyways, so here's... I just want to demonstrate what happened and how it was solved uh, on this example project and maybe uh, give you a bit of a taste of how a decoupling can work in an actual, uh, you know, on an actual real example. So here I made a super simple um, project where we basically have a, uh, a game object. You don't have to worry about this Unity things, just, just sort of try to follow along. Uh, basically, there's a there's a game object. It has a script. This script is called library client, and all it does is nothing. But I want to make it print um, all the available directories that that we've got. Maybe we have an add-on folder. Maybe we have a languages folder. I would like to print them out into the console, into the Unity console, right? Like here, there's a console here. Um, however. I don't want to do it from Unity because this is just not my workflow and I want to have it completely separate. So we're going to utilize a class library. So what I did is I created another project completely separate from Unity um, and it's a class library project. Here it is. And we've got a super simple class. It's called path printer and it has a public uh, void returning method print paths. Now, it wouldn't be that difficult um, to basically import this DLL from. Uh, in fact, we might even do it right now, right? So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, I'm going to publish it with .NET publish configuration release and with an output folder specified. So here it is, and it generates uh, this output. Uh, I've got my library DLL. I've got the debugging, um, the the debugging file for. I don't know, it just, it's like a mapping. I've never actually dug into it, but I'm pretty sure it uh, points like which, um, you know, the, it's the mapping between the code and the actual compiled um, compiled file. And we've got a, a bunch of dependencies, JSON file. The thing is, we actually don't care about those. We only care about the DLL and you don't need the other ones uh, to for, for the library to work. So. Um, using a library in Unity is very trivial. I kind of like their workflow. Uh, what you do is you just drag it in, right? Bam, there you go. Uh, it actually is added here as an asset into this little puzzle piece icon, and there you go. We magically have it. Now, if I go to our script, we can immediately start using, I'm gonna add a directive for my library. That's the using directive uh, that I specified over here. And I can immediately make a new instance of my path printer, I think I called it. And I can call this print paths method. However, there is a problem. The problem is that, first of all, of course, even when I compile it and I run it, it obviously doesn't print anything. But how am I going to print stuff? How am I actually going to print stuff when this library doesn't have Unity um, as a package. So for example, normally here you would do debug.log and you would type in hello world or something, right? This is how you would log to the console in Unity. But there is a problem, that's, and that's this dependency on Unity Engine. And if you hover over this, you can see that this class, the static class, is actually inside Unity Engine.debug. 
but that would kind of like like let's assume that we don't actually want to add uh, unity as a dependency of uh, this project we actually want to have it separate how do we do that well the answer would be um, by our very very familiar pattern called the dependency injection pattern now here what we're going to do i already prepared it so that we don't lose time i'm all like professional now what is it a new year peter actually prepares his videos i know so what i did here is um i prepared a little example where we actually define uh, an interface uh this interface is called i output and it basically signifies something that we can output text into it has this it should have this print method and it should take in a string uh, into it. Now, um, I, I'm going to slightly assume that you guys kind of know what an interface is. Interface doesn't actually have the, the, the method definitions. It only specifies the signature of it, the required signature. Now, that's fine because in our path sprinter we can just accept an instance of this i output uh, store it as a private read-only field and then just simply use it to print our hello world now the thing is let's let's just give it a give it a go here right let's just build this and, and replace it now this is something if you guys are familiar if someone is familiar with unity here i uh haven't found a nice way of doing this but I usually I usually have to delete the actual uh, the actual DLL and I have to um, drag it in there again to force unity to recompile the scripts because uh, you can do it outside of unity but unity just like doesn't register the changes and just doesn't do anything about it you know what I mean and now we, we've got, we're going to have a an error here the error is that this uh, path printer requires a um, requires an instance of a class that implements i output well then that's an easy fix because this uh, because here's the here's the why as well because this interface is public therefore it can be accessed from accessed from other assemblies if this was private if this was private or, or internal uh, the the unity project wouldn't be able to see it now just because of that um, this project actually knows about the the interface as long as it's uh, it has the right using directive etc and so we, what we can do was just for the simplicity i'm going to do it in a in the same file uh, we're going to create a public class called um, unity output output um, where which implements i output right now that's very nice and if we actually implement the interface which is going to force us to create this print method here we can actually use debug.log message now the interesting thing uh, about this which by the way here we could just do as a new unity output instance now the interesting also this could be an expression bodied method see i'm already annoying most people <laughs> So, um, the interesting thing about this is that we postponed that dependency, right? We, if you think about it, can I open paint? Is this an inter interesting thing to paint? Uh, I'm sorry. This is why my videos are not usually well received because I rant about and explore these things. So we've got our Unity project, which kind of depends on Unity itself. That's U for Unity, like the debug right and we've got our l for for library um now it used to be because this is the project um uh, because those two things are this script and unity is basically the same package it's the same thing we actually in in fact we actually implement mono behavior so we technically are a direct descendant of their you know unity engine you know class so technically we're part of it um, it used to be um, that, I'm going to draw it in red, that we, our library, would have to depend on Unity, right? That makes sense. You have to call debug.log, and that's in Unity. So we, our library would be dependent that way. 
But what we did, we were a little cheeky breaky, as kids say these days, um, and we created this interface here. That's not even a relatable joke. And instead, we are depending on this on this um, on this interface. But the funny thing is, it's not really funny, is that this is the part of the same package. It's part of us. And now, if Unity wants to call us, it has to make it has to implement into its output class. It has to implement this interface. And if you notice, now the arrow goes from Unity to us. Before it was us to Unity. Now it's the other way around. And that's why it's a dependency inversion. That's what it's. That's what the principle is called. There's plenty of patterns in the dependency uh, inversion principle. One of the common ones is, as we demonstrated, inverting a dependency using an interface. Right? That's a fairly. I hope. I hope that kind of makes sense. If it doesn't, then uh, let me know. Uh, I'll probably. I probably won't do anything about that. <laughs> All right. So now. Um, because our library actually prints hello world here if we go to unity and it compiles this little package here um, if we run it we should see hello world in the console and we do now that's great that's all great but let's make it spicier we just say hello world we don't say um we don't actually print out any paths so what gives so we're gonna boop uh, go forward in time into a path combine and we're going to make things interesting so apart from requiring an instance of i output and uh, using dependency injection this is the dependency injection pattern we're also going to require a string called base path we're requiring that that is just it's a path right and it's whatever it's a base path where maybe other uh, directories and other files should be located, right? Uh, we're going to store it, and then we have this print pass method, which in this case doesn't just say hello world. Instead, it uses system's path combine and combines the base path with add-ons, right? Because we're trying to get an add-ons directory inside that ba ba base path, and the same for languages directory. Maybe we just want to make sure that those that those uh, you know that those uh, paths exist well then peter why didn't you why don't you just use a uh a concatenation why why isn't this uh a valid approach base path plus like bam and then add-ons right or i could just say simplify it like this um that's a good that's a good uh that's a good question and i urge you to actually look into the msdn documentation for path combine it has a lot of nuance, nuances and it uh, handles a lot of uh, different things like maybe if you're on linux um the the path actually on linux it's very forgiving um but sometimes the the slashes need to be either forward slashes or backslashes and it depends right so it's better to use a very much predefined helper method here, uh, such as path combine. So we're just following best practices, right? And then we just want to output this directory, these two directories, right? Okay, so let's just go for it. And it looks like it's it, it's fairly trivial, but there's going to be a catch. And the catch is actually kind of the point of the video, which uh, should have gotten to it a bit earlier. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Right, so again, we're going to do our little unity dance. Uh, again, if anyone knows, feel free to leave a comment say, telling me that there is a much better, much better version. Maybe I need to delete the meta file as well. Who knows? I don't know. And now we're also, now we're going to get a different, um, a different exception here. And that's that we're missing a formal parameter in this constructor. And that's because we didn't give it the base path. Now, I do have, um, there. there is a shortcut in Unity uh, with application.streamingAssetsPath, which basically gives you, uh, when you're in the Unity editor, um, it gives you a path to uh, the f f a folder with the same name, streaming assets. I kind of have like three files in it. This will be relevant later. Now, that's great, right? W that's it. Let's just run it. However, there we go. This obscure exception. 
This exception says could not resolve type with token 0, 1, 0, 0, bunch of zeros D, right? System IO path, runtime, system runtime, version 5.0. Now that's a big hint. Version 5.0 is a v big, giant hint. What happened is, uh, first of all, if you see an exception kind of like that, that it cannot resolve type with token, um, class assembly, you know, that, that's a very giving thing that um, you're, there are probably frameworks that have a definition that depend, they're compiled with a certain definition of a, or a certain version of a library, but they now have a different version. A lot of the times it will tell you like with uh, a lot of the time uh, this could happen it's something called dependency hell could happen with uh, uh, something like Newton's of JSON in certain in certain applications. Although that exception is a bit more telling because it tells you was expecting version whatever uh, but found the other one. It's more sneak. It's sneakier when it's with system stuff, right? Because system IO, right? Like surely you don't version system IO. Like how do you like you don't even add it as a new Git package? How do you ensure that it's the that is the same um, version? Well, here's the thing. What happened is that uh, Unity supports .NET Standard 2.0, and that's all fine and dandy, and I was truly fine with that. However, in the meantime. Um, since the last time I actually worked with uh, with Unity and with like really libraries in general, um, .NET five released, and default libraries are no longer .NET standard two point two point zero. They actually target .NET five. That's an issue. That's an issue. That's an issue. But it's easily fixable because in the next thing, there you go. We can just change the target from .NET five to .NET, stand, .NET Standard 2.0. So we'll, this will require a quick restore because of course it's a different, we're, different uh, we're targeting a different framework. And that, that should, uh, that will actually resolve our problem. Now, the thing is, w what's the, before I even continue with like, you know, ranting about dependencies and then decoupling, what is the what is like what's the moral of the story well first of all i should have like of course i knew that uh you know that unity supports dotnet standard but i should have made sure that my output target is actually targeting what i what i think it targets right how could i have made sure right depths.json, dependencies json file if i read it it says the target platform runtime target name net standard version 2.0 should have made sure well either way let's take it a bit further and see some more interesting things since we're here so here's the thing if i run it now uh lo and behold my um concatenate my, my path combine actually works there's a it gives me the path to the streaming assets and then adds add-ons and languages here right and it's interesting how the path combines for all its glory is actually like you know using a backslash here where whereas the actual unity path has forward slashes whatever see maybe we would put a forward slash you kind of expected a backslash who knows right <laughs> um the important thing is that that will work in mul on multiple platforms, like including like Android and stuff. Here's the thing. So that's fine. Let's take it a tiny, tiny bit further. Maybe we want to implement a new feature. And that new feature is uh, printing a, you see how I have these files over here in my streaming assets. Maybe I want to print a random one of them. It's a weird feature for your game, but you know, what can you do? This is an example. Um, so here, Five. I'm gonna speed it up a little so that I don't keep you here forever. Um, very simple implementation, right? You you probably saw it. Um, 
we have a new method here. This is the previous one. This is print paths, but we now have a new method called print random file name, which just uses a directory again, system IO directory, uh, gets all the files in the base path. Well, it gets all of the TXT files in the base path and then prints a random one, prints the files with the index of, you know, zero to file that length non, -inclu non inclusive for the upper bound. Now, so that's all fine and dandy, but we're using random here. And we know that uh, we should only have one instance of random in our application. So what we do is we probably just, you know, have an instance here, private one, and we instantiate it. We could have also required it um, as, a, uh, as a parameter. That's neither here nor there. So um, this works fine. I'm not going to do the whole recompile and try it dance. This works fine, but there is something that we're slightly overlooking. And that's the fact that Unity has its own implementation of random. It has its own random. Now, whether one is be better than the other doesn't really matter. The point here is that First of all, the reason for using Unity's uh, random is that you don't have to make an instance of it. It's a static class, so it manages the instance for the entire game, which is great. Um, and the problem might be that if we make multiple instances of our path printer, we're actually making multiple instances of random in this case, and uh, that's kind of that's kind of not, not ideal. Might be a bit less random. Um, or if we require it, then suddenly we're having to, you know actually keep track of a single instance of random inside Unity, which is not common because Unity has their own ran random sort of generator, right? So what we could do is again, kind of decouple in a different way. And that's create a new interface, call it iRandom or whatever, um, then implement the, the only method or the methods that, that we require from it and then have that be uh, as a um, have that be constructor injected into our class right and then we can use a random as we please now the thing is why would you do that more reasons to do that now this class is unit testable before it had its own random instance, there's nothing we can do about it, right? Like here, I'm gonna go back. Um, here, there, like if you run a unit test, try to write a unit test that tests that this method works correctly. Well, you can't do that. It has a random output. Yeah, sure, you can mock the output and see like what it actually outputs, that's great. But you can't test the randomness right it says it's going to be one text file first the other one and like you know it's it's random right but with the new approach we can not only mock the uh, you know mock the output to see what it uh, returns we can also test it for different for different um, random outputs because we can mock the random class and no matter what they ask uh, the, you know no matter what the input output is we can for a specific test, we can maybe force it to return like one, right? And then we know what we expect. So that's another reason. And then here's, this is, by the way, I'm pretty sure this is the last one I've got. I don't have seven. All right. So now we're going to do one more output. And um, we're going to, um, by the way, when we have this iRandom interface, we don't have to force people to implement our, our things. We don't have to like, make sure that someone else there has to make a class that's like you know whatever and and type in like the normal system random we can actually make it for them uh, and so i here implemented system random as an implementation of i random which does the normal thing which you would expect it has one instance of random and actually uses the uh, uses it to to generate random as needed right um, however if we Let's import it to Unity one last time. We do this dance, savor it, because we, we, we're not using Unity ever again. This is not Bracky's tutorial. Um, 
plus that's the point of decoupling from this engine <laughs> anyways um, so now we need a second formal parameter for the um, as the uh, randomness so I'm gonna do public class um, unity random unless unity random exists I don't think it is it does I random and in here we're actually going to implement the real unity random which is just random dot next I'm pretty sure oh uh, or value or some thing do they even see this is why I don't like their oh it's gonna be like range yeah random dot range which is misleading okay first of all why is this misleading it's misleading because you would think that it would give you a range it does not give you a range it gives you a single value Ugh. I get that it's like it, it's random dot in range with slightly better uh, but come on come on unity what is this game developers are not supposed to be this sad all right anyways apparently like readable code goes out the window um, also this might be another reason why this might be a bad name is because there is a thing that exists called enumerable uh, it's in uh, link really well uh, called range which you give it like a range and it returns because um, it's named properly it returns a, a list and enumerable of those it gives you a range I get it that it's kind of named like you have to see it in the context enumerable range random range but come on man come on you could use those two like maybe in the same block maybe like one after the other mmm that's some sketchy territory someone's not gonna I mean I just didn't get it right it took me like seven more seconds to figure it out I'm not the brightest example but then again you know who is you dear viewer you are the brightest example all right so here I have an instance of unity output unity random and of course the the formal parameter for the path now of course I also should print random file name I actually should call it somewhere and that should allow us to uh, print a random file name unless there's an off by one in which case well tough luck there it is right fine so so we have the same thing and then we have file three and if I run it one more time it's like file two now pretty good pretty random random to me now one last thing is that we maybe we're not satisfied with unity's random maybe I don't like that I don't mm -mm. so instead I could replace this with system random the one that we implemented in our library now the difference will probably be nothing because it's like random it's just random right so this is like again file 2 and then maybe maybe it could be file 2 again I mean it is file 2 again <laughs> and maybe it's gonna be file 2 again no it's not it's file 3 it's truly random um, but this decision is up to us and it doesn't have to be in the context of the game it could be in the context of a unit test as I mentioned earlier or I don't know maybe you find a very much better way of uh, you know of actually using randomness now what's the interesting now, now what's the what's the, another moral of this long story you could infinitely wrap different things we still have a dependency depends on this one this is a dependency we're depending on system IO now you could always go super super overboard with this and um, decouple your code from basically all platform platform code uh, but you got to draw a line somewhere um, of course you could either force the the client the thing that uses your library to provide you implementations of things but if it's like two simple things like imagine you have a database library and it tries to like and it wants you to implement like path combine or uh, was it like directory get files right it makes sense in certain applications and cer certainly this approach would not work for example in a universal Windows platform application or some of the 
um, some of the other platforms that actually support .NET standard um, when they abstract the file system. So maybe actually directory operations and getting f of files might be a great target for abstracting. Um, but you might also think about not abstracting as an individual method, but rather an operation on top of it. Maybe you already require them to implement the whole thing where they give you a random file. Who knows, right? But it's a balancing act. You do not want to actually, more often than not, you do not actually want to get rid of every single using directive that isn't implemented here in our uh, in our library. That would be that would be fairly impractical. Uh, you gotta weigh it against the benefits, is what I'm saying. All right. Well, I hope you guys uh, kind of got something out of this whole ordeal with. Uh, we you know we kind of went through dependency injection which is great we kind of went through inversion of control as a principle um, we went through a bit of C sharp we, we kind of saw a very obscure and interesting exception that isn't very well you know like I I've encountered it for the first time you know uh, yesterday or wh whenever I was doing that um, and we saw a tiny tiny bit of unity which might be very interesting for you guys and also, uh, we kind of we, we kind of um, saw that you can actually implement your game outside of Unity. And uh, if you have a .NET standard library, Drexis would love this. Um, you can actually implement your game in Unity. You can also implement it in Blazor. So Blazor WebAssembly, you can run in a browser without the Unity game engine, like actually run in the browser. Um, of course, you could run it on in a console app as well, or in like an Avalonia app, you know, world is your oyster, I think. Um, all right, so thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this video wasn't too boring. It was 30 minutes long. That's short for me. And I'll see you guys in the next video, hopefully not next year. 